Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thanks. Let's go ahead and take a look at our particular solution to the given differential equation that satisfies the initial condition. We know that we can solve a differential equation algebraically using our techniques if we can separate the variables. And so, are we able to separate the variables through multiplication or division in this case, Marissa? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We could divide over that quantity, y minus 1, multiply over that differential dx, and we'll get all the y's on the left and all the x's on the right. So, first step, we'll divide over and multiply over and separate the variables. Next, we'll go ahead and integrate both sides as an operation. So, we'll integrate both sides. On the left, integrating with respect to y generates what overall rule, Sophia? Yeah, natural log. And so long as I have the derivative of that quantity, bless you, 1 dy, and I do, I can go straight to natural log of absolute value of quantity y minus 1 equals 5. Remember, with indefinite integration, we technically have a plus c here, but if we lump those constants in on the independent variable side, that is the x variable side, then we'll take care of that plus c all at once with a single constant integration on the right. On the right hand side, we're going term by term x squared over 2, is that right? x squared over 2 plus x and plus c. So we have to have our constant of integration, right? And by putting it on the independent variable, side, we just have to do a single one. All right, now what do we want? Well, we want the particular solution that satisfies the initial condition. So, as with lots of things in math, we've got a couple different paths we can go by and still get the same ultimate result. We could plug in our initial condition right now and solve for c, right, and then go back and rewrite and solve for y last, or we could go ahead and proceed and solve for y now and plug in our initial condition last. The choice is yours. I kind of like to solve for the y now and get the general. That lets me uh, kind of group in that unknown constant c sometimes, and then plug in a single time at the end with a single rewrite and not have to uh, solve after the fact. The choice is yours. I'm going to go ahead and solve for y, though. So to do that, we'll undo natural log. How do we undo natural log? Well, we'll exponentiate. That is, raise both sides e to the. And that gets rid of our ln. Still have the bars, though. Then all up in the exponent. I've got e to the x squared over 2 plus x plus c all up in the exponent. Now I can go ahead and grab this sum. Oh, I'm just going to do one of them. Ooh. Recognize. I better recognize. I'm going to go ahead and grab onto that sum in my exponent and use my properties of exponents to rewrite that as a product of powers with like bases. And so I'll grab onto that plus c at the end, right, and make it e to the c times e to the x squared over 2 plus x. That allows us to that allows us to get rid of the bar, absolute value bars by applying the plus or minus to that e to the c, that constant that we don't know, and it can kind of absorb that plus or minus as an unknown constant, right, and then rename it a. So we'll go ahead and apply those bars to the next step, and we write this as y minus 1 is equal to plus or minus e to the c, and then times e to the x squared over 2 plus x. This allows us to grab onto that plus or minus e to the c, and maybe call that, right, call that a constant a. So I get a times e to the x squared over 2 plus x is equal to y minus 1. And now I can solve to get the general solution y equals 1 plus a to the e to the x squared over 2 plus x. All right, but we still have it pinned down that unknown constant a. That will use our given condition. That is y of 0 equals 4. So I'll go ahead and plug in 4 for y. And we'll plug in 0 for x. In doing so, I get e to the 0 plus 0 is 0. And this makes it easy to solve for a because e to the 0 is 1, which means that 4 equals 1 plus a. Therefore, a must equal 3. Raise your hand if you had 3 for your value of a. Did you get 3? Yes, that's great news. But we're not done. We can still rewrite now our particular solution y equals. So we'll still write our particular solution y equals 1 plus 3 e to the x squared over 2 plus x. So raise your hand if you had your final answer. Everybody get the 
hey, that's good news. Great. Okay, so we can solve a differential equation, provided that differential equation is separable, and then use my given condition to pin down unknown constants. Emily? Is it okay to separate the exponents to e? Oh, would like you make it e to the x? E to times the x e. times e to the x. Certainly. Yeah, you certainly could do that. That is equivalent, right? That is equivalent. Um, because my then I have two powers as opposed to having one power. I left it together, uh, but it's certainly equivalent. And you're welcome to do that. Good. Other questions about one? Okay. So your OTL number zero, right, was meant to bring up some of your prior knowledge you were investigated in the beginning of the year, unit one with our BC prerequisites. Let's go ahead and see if we can't state the first four terms of the sequence, and then determine if the terms converge. That is. Is there a limit, right, as n goes to infinity of the nth term? Can I evaluate that? Do the terms converge to a particular value as n gets infinitely large? That is, as the terms, right, continue to progress. All right, so let's go ahead and get the first four terms. We know we can get the first term as easy as plugging in 1 for my term number n everywhere I see it working out. And so when we do that, I get 1 minus 2 times 1 is 2 over 1 plus 2 times 1 is 2, so I get 1 minus 2 is negative 1 third. I'm getting negative 1 third. Raise your hand if you had a sub 1 is negative 1 third. Great. If I were to do a sub 2, and we won't do all of them longhand, we'll see the pattern here. If I were to do a sub 2, I would get 1 minus 2 times 2 is 4 over 1 plus 4. And now I'm getting negative 3 fifths. We could go and proceed like this, and we can see what would happen if we get 1 minus 6 is negative 5, over 1 plus 6 is 7, and so I'd get negative 5 sevenths. And so if we were to expand our first four terms, we would get, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to go with my little set of numbers, and they are negative 1 third, <coughs> negative 3 fifths, negative five sevenths. All right, go ahead and share the fourth term then. You can see the pattern as it progresses. What do we have for that fourth term, Courtney? Negative seven ninths. Negative seven ninths, good. These are the first four terms. What we know, we could then let the term number go towards infinity and continue to extend that pattern. Awesome. So raise your hand if you have the first four terms correct. Great, and now we can determine if the term values converge. That is, does a sub n, the nth term, approach a particular value as n grows infinitely large? Well, let's see. We have our tool bag, right, where we can evaluate limits. So I'll go ahead and rewrite my limit. And consider as n goes to infinity, and I grab the, this should be an n. I grab the little pre thing in my math pack. So this should be n goes to infinity. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This should be n. When as n goes to infinity, we fix that. Oh, and we'll plug in our nth term given by 1 minus 2n, or 1 plus 2n. Okay. So upon initial evaluation, you guys hopefully right, have, are familiar with your trying the first time with direct substitution and seeing right, what you're working with. And from there, then you can select it and, uh, and apply the most appropriate tool to continue the evaluation. You're probably getting negative infinity over infinity, right? That is an indeterminate form, and it does authorize use of lopi tall's I'm not going to use lopi tall's rule here, though. The reason for that is twofold. One, here, we're not dealing with a continuous function, which, which is going to be OK. We're dealing with a sequence. Remember, the sequence only exists for domain values that are integers, term 1, term 2, term 3. And so we're not dealing with a continuous function here, right, the way that we're accustomed to. Secondly, I want to practice with our algebraic techniques that don't involve the use of the because they're going to help us out when, we're, when we don't have uh, a function that we can differentiate our derivative rules, right? If we're dealing with a different type of algebraic expression with, for a sequence. So I want to practice not using L'Hopital's, knowing that we do have that, right, in our back pocket, right, just in case. And so L'Hopital's is a very powerful tool. I don't want to downplay its importance, but I also want to focus on other algebraic techniques now that we're dealing with sequences. So what can we do? Well, one algebraic technique is dividing everything by the largest exponent of n that occurs, and then evaluating using our, our known, right, our determinant forms, as opposed to our indeterminate form that is currently listed. What? Well, if n to the first is our highest power of n that occurs, we could divide everything by n. 
I would very agree with rewrite that as one over n. So let's everybody try this, because I know the many of you will probably use L'Hopital's rule. Why would we do this? Well, take a look. If I were now to consider the limit as n goes to infinity, I would get 1 times 1 over n is 1 over n minus 2n over n is 2. Do I see that? All over 1 times 1 over n is 1 over n. And 2n times 1 over n is plus 2. Algebraically, right, we've rewritten this in such a way that results in determinate forms, not indeterminate forms, and we didn't have to use what we call the rule. Take a look at our quantity 1 over n. As n goes to infinity, is this indeterminate or determinate? No, this is determinate, right? We spent a lot of time evaluating these in the past. We know that as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to zero. As n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to zero. And so I'm left trying to evaluate the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, I just did. I just I just let n go to infinity, so I'm not going to write the limit anymore. I'm going to actually write what's left. We get negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. Awesome. Do the terms converge? Yes? The terms converge. In fact, their value approaches negative 1. And you guys can see this. If we were to extend this pattern, we could see the next one would be negative 9 elevenths, negative 11 thirteenths, negative 13 fifteenths. Do you see how it's getting closer and closer and closer? Is that fraction that's closer to negative 1? OK. And so the nth term does converge. Before we do our OTL collection, I want to just pose the question. What about the series, that is the sum of these terms? Would the series converge? Well, as we continue, right, taking higher and higher term values and, and summing these together, if the nth term is converging to negative 1, and we continued adding that to the previous sum, would the overall sum, right, converge to a particular value? No, it would continue getting more and more negative and growing forever, or I guess decreasing forever, right? And so I want you to know, right, back from our BC prereq unit, a big thing today is if the nth term, right, doesn't converge to zero, then we've got no hope for the series, that is the sum of the terms, to converge, right, and have a finite sum. That is the series, right, will diverge if the infinite term, uh, the, the nth term does not converge to zero. All right, enough. Enough, I don't want to give away the whole lesson. We'll pause the recording, take care of double check. Me too. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so for our warm up today, again, I want to make the distinction between a sequence and a series, right? So our sequence, right, is our, our collection, our list, right, of objects, or in this case, numbers, right, our list of, our list of terms. A series is the sum. Right, the sum of terms. So let's go ahead and consider here the partial sums here. We'll call S of n the nth partial sum. So S sub 1 would be the sum of the first term. Right? S sub 2 would be the sum of the first two terms. S sub 3 would be the sum of the first three terms, and so on and so forth. If everybody could go ahead and do that for our warm up, then we can get going for our discussion today. Thanks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So we're continuing to find the right, find the partial sums associated with this sequence given by T sub n, whose first three terms are one, two thirds, three fifths. And I'm going to use the math rack on my calculator just to make this easier. We can develop a pattern, right? Uh, then we can use that pattern for subsequent evaluation if necessary. Let's go ahead and do our S sub one would just be the sum of the first term, and so that's just one. S sub two is one plus. Yeah. Two thirds, right? So one plus two thirds is going to be three thirds plus two thirds is five thirds. Is that right? Five thirds. 
S sub 3 would have given my 1 plus 2 thirds plus 3 fifths, right? And so now is about, that's the extent of my fraction ability. So 1 plus 2 thirds plus 3 fifths. And then we can math bracket. So it looks like 34 fifteenths. So 34 fifteenths. And then I can just add on the next term plus to keep going, right, for my fourth partial sum. It looks like my fourth term would be 1, 2, 3, 4 sevenths. Is that right? 4 sevenths. So I'm getting 4 sevenths added on to my previous. And I'm getting 298 one oh fifths. 298 one oh fifths. As you consider, and this is only four partial sums, right? There could be an infinite number of, of partial sums as we continue to extend this pattern and continue adding on subsequent terms. Does it appear as though this series converges to a finite, a finite number? Well, let's see. We went from one to five thirds, right? So one to one and two thirds, then to thirty-four fifteenths, which is that more or less than two. More than 2 to 298 105ths. Does it look like this is going to converge to a finite value? No. Could we see that without having to extend this and continue on and finding our partial sum, S sub 5, S sub 6? Well, recall from our bell work that we know if our nth term does not converge to zero, then there's no way the series, that is the sum of the individual terms, is going to equal a finite amount, right? The only way for our series to converge is if the nth term converges to zero, right? If that converges to zero quickly enough, then it's possible that the sum of these infinite number of terms will approach a finite value. But if the nth term does not converge, to zero, then there's no hope for the series converging to a value. It will be infinite, and so it will diverge. So let's go ahead and then just show that so that we can save time and energy. Let's consider the limit of the nth term. If that doesn't converge to zero, then there's no hope for the series converging. So let's go ahead and verify that. The limit is n goes to infinity of a sub n. And, oh, I'm sorry. Did we call it t sub n already? So it's t sub n. Again, this will be getting algebraic. So the limit of n goes to infinity of t sub n is given by the limit as n goes to infinity of, and what was n over, was it 2n minus 1? Initial evaluation results in an indeterminate form, infinity over infinity, right? And yet we'll practice with our algebraic techniques. What well, could we multiply both top and bottom by right here to algebraically evaluate this limit? Could we? Uh, 1 over n. Yeah, let's do 1 over n, that is, divide each term by the highest power of n that appears and see if we can evaluate. Thank you. So that would be the limit as n goes to infinity of n times 1 over n is 1 over 2n times 1 over n is 2 minus 1 over n. Did this help us? Well, certainly. We can see now that as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0, and I'm left with the limit of 1 half. The limit of a constant is a constant. All we're going to about it now, so I'm getting 1 half. Do the terms converge in this sequence? Yes, they do. Do they converge to 0? No. Is it possible that the series converges? No. Unless the terms converge to zero, there's no hope, right? We'll continue adding on. We'll continue adding on one half and one half and one half, guaranteeing that the series, that is the sum of the, all the terms, right, will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow forever. It will not converge. It will not be finite. So this series diverges. Cool. All right. So every series has two sequences associated with it. The first is the sequence of terms which produce the series. Uh, consider the first five terms of this series, one half to the n. Let's see. T sub n would be the collection of terms given by term number one. So let's see. 
1 would be n equals 1, so that would be 1 half. Next would be 1 fourth. Is that what you guys are getting? And then 1 eighth. Oh, I see what's going on here. 1 sixteenth. 1 thirty second. And while the sequence t sub n would go on forever, the fifth partial sum given by our sigma notation here would just be the sum of the first five terms. So we've got two, se uh, two sequences associated with the series. We've got the sequence of terms, and then we've got the sequence of partial sums, right? S sub n leading to the ultimate sum sought. And so if we were doing the sum from 1 to 5 of the nth term given by 1 half to the n, then the partial sums in this sequence, do I have a slide for it? S sub n, the partial sums, right, would be given by S sub 1. First, let's do this out. 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 thirty second. That would be exact the sum of the first five terms in the sequence given by 1 half to the n. So our sequence of partial sums then would be S sub 1. That would be the sum of the first term. That would be 1 half. S sub 2 uh, would be the sum of the first two terms. And that would be 1 half plus 1 fourth. So 1 half plus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. Is that right? Yes? S sub 3. 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. And so, goodness gracious, 6 eighths plus 1 eighth is 7 eighths? 7 eighths? Ugh, that's hard. Uh, S sub 4, I'm going to go right to my 7 eighths plus. What would I be adding on? I'd be adding on 1 16th. So I've got 14 16 plus 1 16th is 15 16 And S sub 5, Right, which would be my ultimate partial, uh, my ultimate sum sauce, would be 15 sixteenths plus 1 thirty second would be 30 thirty seconds plus 1 thirty seconds is 31 thirty seconds. All right, so we've seen that my sequence of terms is given by term values 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth. My sequence of partial sums is given by 1 half, 3 fourths, 7 eighths, 15 sixteenths, 31 30 seconds. If we could generate a formula that gives the nth partial sum and then consider its limit as n goes to infinity, we determine then if the series converges as opposed just to the term converge. All right, so let's go ahead and see what this would be. The sequence of partial sums would be 1 half, 3 fourths, 7 eighths, 15 sixteenths, 31, 30 seconds, 31, Could we generate a rule for the nth partial sum, call it S of n? All right, can we make a rule? Well, let's look. 1 half, 3 fourths, 7 eighths, 15 sixteenths, 31 30 seconds, right? What's true about the numerator and denominator of these fractions, of these partial sums? Sophia? Yeah, it's two what? What's that? Two times the previous numerator plus one, yes. So the seven times 2 is 14 plus 1 is giving me the 15. Yes, the 15 times 2 gives me 30 plus 1 is 31. Yes. How about the numerator versus the denominator? A difference of 1, right? So can we take those patterns and generalize a, a rule that would give us the nth partial sum, right? Yeah, we could. Uh, let's go back to our 
Remember, that means we'd be able to plug it in. <laughs> Just to verify, I'm an eraser. It means we plug it in and it spits out, right? It spits out estimate. If we plugged in three, it should spit out seven eighths. Did everybody see that? If we plug in five, it should spit out 32, 30 seconds. And so what connects in with my denominators? Two, four, eight, 16, 32, those are all what? Those are all two to the, right? Two to the power. In fact, this is two to the uh, fourth. And that's the one, two, three, fourth term. Yes. Oh, gosh. It's going to work out nicely. So my denominator looks like that's easy to write in general. In a couple of your homework problems, you have to like generate, you have to make up the rule. And then you already said the numerator was always one away from the denominator. So wouldn't that just be one away from that? So how would I write that? To the n and then minus one on the ground floor. So my nth partial sum, call it s of n, is given by 2 to the n minus 1 all over 2 to the n. Let's try it. We're going to plug in 5. By plug in 5, I get 2 to the 5th is 32 minus 1 is 31 all over 32. Okay. So my s of n works. Cool. So what then is the infinite series when that takes the... Oh, Tyler said all night on that. Infinite series is the sum of an infinite number of terms, not just the first five. Right? If we were to continue going on forever and ever and ever, summing the terms of a sequence forever. And if we could write a generalized rule for that, that is an infinite, right? An infinite sum, and evaluate the limit as n goes to infinity of my generalized formula S sub n, then I could be able to tell whether or not the series converges. If the sequence of partial sums converge to a value, then the infinite series converges. If the limit of the partial sums does not exist or is infinite, then the series diverges. All right, so we already saw how this was one half to the n, and then this would be forever doing the one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus. But we also generalize the formula for s of n. So if s of n was given by 2 to the n minus 1 all over 2 to the n, we can tell whether or not the series converge or diverge by considering the limit of the partial sum. That is the limit if n goes to infinity of 2 to the n minus 1 all over 2 to the n. Initial evaluation of this expression results in what? Well, if n goes to infinity, where's the top do? It goes to infinity. Where's the bottom do? It goes to infinity as well, right? And so, is there anything we can do algebraically, right, without what we call the rule to investigate this further? Well, yeah, we've got a sum or difference in the numerator of a fraction. We could break this up as a sum or difference of individual fractions, these with the same denominator, and see if that helps us. That is to say, the limit of 2 to the n minus 1 all over 2 to the n as n goes to infinity is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the n over 2 to the n minus 1 over 2 to the n. Why is that helpful? Well, guys, 2 to the n over 2 to the n is just 1. And now I've taken an indeterminate form and rewritten as a determinate form. Right? What is this approach? As n goes to infinity, what happens to this fraction? Goes to zero, leaving me with one. By golly. That's pretty sweet. <coughs> well, could we have seen that? Well, it depends what you call by seeing that. I mean, look at our sequence of partial sum. After four, we're already at 15 sixteenths. Then we're at 31 30 seconds. What would the next one be? You can call out 63, 64. That's pretty close to one, right? Already, and we're only at the sixth partial sum, okay? Sometimes it's easy to see, sometimes it's not easy to see, and that's why we have to develop our algebraic techniques. All right. So let's go ahead and consider this 
let's go ahead and list the first several terms, right? So that we can, can see if there's a pattern and then we'll be able to say whether or not this converges or, or diverges, right? And we've got a couple different tools at our disposal. First, we've got our nth term test. If the nth term does not converge to zero, there's no hope for my series to converge. It will automatically diverge. So let's go ahead and consider the first several terms. So, do you guys have this or are you not? Oh, sorry, you have one going on. Yeah. Okay. So this would be 2 to the first would be 2 plus 2 to the second will be 4. Is that right? Plus 2 to the third would be 8 plus, well, I've got a bad feeling about this. What do you notice about the terms? Yeah, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's no way that the series would converge if my nth terms right, aren't approaching zero. If my nth term isn't approaching zero, there's no way that my series, the sum of those terms, is going to converge to a finite amount. Marissa? Okay. Can I ask you a question about the last one? Yes. So we did this, this part. Are you talking about this one? Um, no, where we did. On a warm up? We did the limit, yeah, of the warm up one. Yes. Yeah. So that was one half, and I thought, unless I heard you wrong, did you say that if that doesn't converge to zero, then the series has no hope for converging? Correct. If the nth term does not converge to zero, then there's no hope for the series to converge. Okay. But look at the look at the the rule for this t sub n. The rule for this was this, right? Yeah. Okay. And the rule for the other one's different. Yes. So what makes the difference? It all depends on what our rule is. Okay. Right? It all depends on what our rule is. First test. We, if we're asked if a series converges, should be, does the nth term converge to zero? Okay. If the nth term doesn't converge to zero, then we can stop right there and say the series diverges. However, it doesn't go the other way. If the nth term does converge to zero, it doesn't mean that the series converges. It just means that now it's possible that the series converges. We need to determine, does the nth term converge to zero quickly enough, right, that the sum of all the terms is finite as opposed to infinite? That's going to be the key, right? And that's why we need all these algebraic te uh, techniques. And it's a good, good morning, Becky. Please have your attention. All staff and students in the building. What? Wait. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So we've seen that if we can write a general formula that gives the nth partial sum, and then evaluate the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth partial sum, if that approaches a finite number, if that equals a finite number, then the series converges. If that limit does not exist, right, or is infinite, then the series diverges. All right, so we showed that this particular series, the sum of one half plus one fourth plus one eighth dot 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 converges, and the sum equals one. We've seen that geometrically in some puzzles in the past. We considered this next one, and because the nth term does not converge to zero, in fact, it continues to grow larger and larger, there's no way that the series converges. And so this is infinite. That means the series diverges. And we didn't have to go through the rigmarole of generating a formula for S of n. All right, let's consider the series given by the sum of terms whose value is one third to the n. Let's list the first several of these. So my first term would be given by one third to the first is one third plus the second term would be one third squared is one ninth. Yes, one ninth plus one twenty seven plus <laughs> plus two plus. 181st, is that right? Yes? Okay. So before we go, and dot, dot, dot. Now, the series is infinite, right? It's the sum of an infinite number of terms. We've seen earlier that if the term values are converging to zero, then it's possible the series converges. Please consider the term values as n goes to infinity, just the one third to the n part. 
does it appear as though the terms converge to zero? Yes, it does. So is it possible the series converges? Yes, it is. If the nth term didn't converge to zero, then we could stop right there and say the series diverges. However, we don't know, right, if the nth term converges to zero quickly enough to ensure that the infinite sum will be finite, right? That is, we could continue adding on a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and continue to grow and grow forever. So the question is, does the nth term converge to zero quickly enough to ensure that the series is finite? All right, so let's consider the limit of partial sum. <clears throat> and so my limit is n goes to infinity of partial sums. Could we write a formula for the partial sum? Oh, I want one more page. Gosh. So what were our, um, our terms? Our terms were from 1 to infinity of 1 third to the n. And so far, we had 1 third plus 1 ninth plus 1 plus 1 plus dot, dot, dot. So our first partial sum would just be 1 third. Our second partial sum, call it S of 2, would be 1 third plus 1 ninth, right? That would be 3 ninths. Plus one ninth is four ninths, is that right? Four ninths. Our third partial sum, the sum for the first three terms, would be given by one third plus one ninth plus one twenty seven. So let's see. That would be twelve twenty sevenths plus one is Did you guys math bracket, did you guys get thirteen twenty sevens? Yes. Yes? One more, and then we can get a generous roll. Yeah, are you guys up for the task? So, oh, all right, equals. All right, can you add 181st on the last one in the math bracket? 39 81st. 39 81st? Oh, Goodness. 40 80 firsts? Yes? Can we write a generalized rule for S of n? That is the nth partial sum. Right? So we've got S of 1 and dot dot dot. Can you see a pattern? 1 third, 4 ninths, 13 27. Can we write a generalized rule for S of n? Where we could plug in n and it would spit out. The end partial sum? Four, four, right? Can we plug in four and it spit out 48 firsts? Can we do that? Well, there's definitely a pattern here. Do you guys see it? What can we do this time? Okay, it's not the same as last time. It's not the two to the n minus one all over two to the n, but you guys see it? The denominators certainly, right, have a pattern, Grace? Um, the numerator is always one half the denominator minus one. One half the denominator minus one. You guys see that? Half, oh, or is it, is it minus one halves? Is it a thing? Like it? Either. Well, one less than the denominator. Halves. One less than the denominator. Halves. One less than the denominator. Half. You guys see that? Okay. So if we could generalize the denominator with an nth rule, then we could just subtract one from it and divide by two. Yes. All right. So what's the denominator given by? Three to the n straight up. Three to the fourth is eighty-one. Three to the third is twenty-seven. So if our denominator is three to the n, then we can use Grace's pattern to do what? Three to the n, take away one, and then halves. Does this work? Okay, let's try four. So we plug in four and we get three to the fourth is eighty-one minus one is eighty, divided by two is forty, over three to the fourth is eighty-one. Four eighty first, yes? Awesome. Good job. So who cares? Because now if the limit of the partial sums converges, then we know the series converges to that value. Let's do some more, and then we'll get our rule. So the limit, consider the limit as n goes to infinity of S of n. 
is given by the limit as n goes to infinity of our nth partial sum rule is 3 to the n minus 1 half all over 3 to the n. Yes? Emily? Wait, why do you rewrite the limit as n goes to infinity? We want to see if this partial sums converge to a value without having to keep doing s sub 5, s sub 6, s sub 7, right? We want to see if these converge to a, a value. In our previous one, we saw it was easy to see how they're going 7 eighths, 15 sixteenths, 31 30 seconds, 63 64. So we could kind of see that they were converging to one. Here, I don't see what they're converging to. You guys see what they're converging to? So I want to consider if my nth partial sum, right, if this converges to a value, if it does, then that's the sum of all the terms forever. Right? And that's what the infinite series is. You're saying, why did I write this again? Or why did I write this again? Like, why did you write it two times, basically? Oh, because we're going to keep the limit until we plug it in at the very end. I'm going to write it three times. I'm going to write it now again. Okay. Uh, until we do the plug in at the end. I just wanted to start with this because this is the always, if the limit of the nth partial sum converges to value, in this particular case, S sub 1 is this. And then now I'm going to keep going and keep doing the limit until the very end. So we want to get to a point where we can, we can evaluate this and get a number. Or get infinity and say that I diverges. So let's keep going. Ready? So how can I algebraically manipulate this? Well, right now it's going to infinity over infinity is indeterminate. So let's algebraically do that. So what can I do? Well, I can keep the two down at the bottom and make this 3 to the n minus 1 all over 2 times 3 to the n. Right? So we can go ahead and divide by 2 is the same as 1 over 1 half. And now we can use our summer difference in the numerator. Do you guys see that? Our summer difference in the numerator? To break this up into a summer difference of fractions with the sum, same denominator. So I get 3 to the n over 2 times 3 to the n minus 1 over 2 times 3 to the n. And why is that helpful? Well, now we can continue to reduce what's 3 to the n over 3 to the n? 1. So I get 1 half from the first term minus 1 over 2 times 3 to the n. Consider the value of this expression as n goes to infinity. What happens to this overall expression as n goes to infinity? Well, as n goes to infinity, what happens to the second term? It goes to 0. This whole term goes to zero. The denominator goes to infinity. That is no longer indeterminate. It's determinate. N equals zero. Therefore, the sequence of partial sums converges to a value, one half, and that value represents, is, right, is the sum of all of the terms. An infinite number of terms equals a finite sum. So what do we say? The series converges. All right. There has to be an easier way because, right, Grace was good at recognizing patterns. But bless you, right? But it seems like gener generalizing an nth, right, the nth partial sum on our own, right, could become complicated and takes a lot of time. So if we could instead recognize when we could use already created formulas to save us time and energy, right, then we wouldn't have to generate a generalized rule for the nth partial sum every single time and evaluate its limit. All right, so recall the formula for our, our nth partial sum of a geometric sequence. Notice how this was a common ratio r, in this case one third, to the nth power. That's just a geometric sequence, right? A geometric sequence. And then the sum of the terms in a geometric sequence, well, for a partial sum, that is the, the, um, the nth term, the nth partial sum is given by the first term's value, g sub 1, times the quantity 1 minus r to the n all over 1 minus r. And we did that back in our BC prerequisite, you know, 1. Now consider the limit as n goes to infinity of this generalized rule. So here's our generalized rule. Let's do it one time, and then we can apply our rule without having to write our, S, our own S event every time. So what would this be? It would be the limit of g sub 1 times quantity 1 minus r to the n all over 1 minus r. 
as n goes to infinity, what happens to this term? Well, if my ratio r is less than 1, as was the case with our previous sequence, right, 1 third, then what will happen to this term? Well, if r is less than 1, then this term will go to 0. 1 third, right, to the n would be 0. And I'd be left with the value of the first term, that is g sub 1, over 1 minus r. Where g sub 1 is the value of the first term. <coughs> And R is my combination. But this is only true if my common ratio of R is less than 1. Okay. So that's all the space where I just tried to cram it in. Now I have lots of space to do what I just did. Again, that's only if R is less than 1. So if the sequence of terms converging, is the sequence of terms converging enough? To ensure the infinite sum will also converge, and that's what we must consider. All right, so here we go. Our practice. Firstly, does the nth term converge to zero? So you consider the limit of the term values, and in this case, the limit of the term values would be two times one fourth to the n. So I'm thinking, does the limit as n goes to infinity of base of n? equals zero. In this case, yes. Is this a geometric series? Yes. So this is a geometric series with r equals what? One fourth. Therefore, must converge And what does it converge to? Well, now I've got a formula. If it's geometric and r, absolute value of r, is less than 1, then it converges to, and this is the formula you'll see in your text, simply a over 1 minus r. So now a is my first term because we're dealing with the realm of sequences. a is my first term. And r is my ratio between successive terms, my one-fourth in this case. Let's do it. So what does this one converge to? Go, go, gadget on this one converge to what's the first term? Well, when n equals, we, go to, we have to go to my index here. Okay, my first term. One goes in for n, one-fourth. So the first is one-fourth times two is one-half. Yes, one-half. So a is one-half over 1 minus what's r? r is 1 fourth. So I can evaluate this and get 1 half over 1 minus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So 1 half divided by 3 fourths is the same as 1 half times 4 thirds. Can you guys see that? And that's the same as two-thirds. This pretty much closes the door, right, on geometric series. If r, the absolute value of r, is less than 1, then we don't have to go through trying to generate a sequence of partial sums and generalize the rule with s sub n and then consider limit as n goes to infinity. All we do is we pick out is a geometric. If it is, is r less than 1? Is our absolute value of r less than 1? If it is, then we can just say it converges to a over 1 minus r. So that's how times it. But in your homework, not all of them are geometric. Sometimes you have to make your list just like we did. And that's why I wanted to do both things, even when we had a geometric sequence, so that you'd be comfortable trying it out. Let's consider b. Consider this series, whose terms are given by n over 2n minus 1. Let's go ahead and begin this series. When n equals 1, my first term would be 1 over 2 minus 1 is 1, so I get 1 plus when n is 2, I get 2 over 
3. Plus when n equals 3, I get 3 over Five, three fifths. Can we extend it? Yeah, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, and bottom is one, three, five, seven, nine. Okay. So does it appear as though the terms converge? Well, I don't know. My first question, when asked about the series converging, should be, what's the limit? of the nth term. Well, consider then the limit of n goes to infinity of the nth term. Does this equal zero? Well, initial evaluation gives me infinity over infinity indeterminate. No problem. I'll multiply everything by 1 over n. the greatest power of n that appears, and try to evaluate again. That would be 1 over 2 minus 1 over n. And if I try again, 1 over n goes to 0, and I'm left with 1. This looks familiar. So does the nth term converge? Yes. Does it converge to 0? No. Does the series converge? No. If my nth term doesn't converge to 0, then there's no hope of the series converging. So. The series diverges. Barricade and all, we're going to make this. So, how is it even possible for an infinite sum to converge? Great question. Two, for a series to converge, the nth term of the sequence must. Blah, blah, blah. What must be true about the partial sums of a series in order for the series to converge? And what must be true for a geometric series to converge if such a geometric series does converge? What does it converge to? So these are kind of our big pictures for the day. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, how is it even possible for an infinite sum to converge in the first place? Right? Aren't we adding an infinite number of terms? Danny? Um, if it checks the terms, like, go to zero, it, like, stops. So, if, right, if we're adding, if we're adding zero, right, if we're adding a term value that's approaching zero to our sum, the infinite sum could be finite. However, we must point out that we're not adding zero, we're adding a term value that's approaching zero, right, to our, to our sum. And if that term value is approaching zero quickly enough, then the overall, overall infinite sum could be finite. I'm going to do this too. Sorry. I'm going to do that. Too. Could be. Doesn't mean it is. Good. Thank you. For a series to converge, the nth term for sure of the sequence must be what? Kobe? Zero. Yeah, it has to be zero. So the nth term must converge to zero to have be any hope, as Danny talked about in number one. Number three, what must be true about the partial sums of the series in order for the series to converge? And what has to be true about the partial sums? Well, the partial sums right, must converge to a value. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the partial sum s of n, n must equal some number, some constant number that is finite. In order for the series to converge. If the limit of partial sums is infinite or does not exist, then the series diverges. All right, now let's narrow our window of focus. If we're dealing with the geometric series, what has to be true about the geometric series in order to converge? Sophia? Yep, and I'll add that the absolute value of r, because there's a couple in your assignment with negative r values, but the absolute value of r must be less than, strictly, 
1 in order for my geometric series to converge. But if r is less than 1, the absolute value of r is less than 1, then we know what it converges to. It converges and it converges to what, Riley? Uh, Good. And that's the same as a over 1 minus r in your textbook, where a is the first term, r is a constant ratio. Great work today, and we did it with 40 seconds left. So, nice job. Thank you.